we hope to be noticed and finally get a commendation or a promotion. Such is the practice we have in serving God. Some people fe feel, I have to perform for God, to be loved by God. But then you're not realizing what the Bible says, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to be good, for, good enough. While we were yet sinners, we don't have to perform for God. He loves us as we are. Get out of this self-deception that you have to perform for Him to be loved more by Him. The message that I have today. The top 10 destructive lies Christians believe about themselves. The top 10 destructive lies Christians believe about themselves. I hope we still have the culture of bringing our Bibles and bringing our notes. If we can all settle down. If we could all please settle down. I hope we have that culture of bringing notes and bringing Bibles to, to church, especially with this message. The top 10 destructive lives Christians believe about themselves. How many have ever been lied to before? How many of you have ever been lied to? Okay, how many of you like being lied to? How many of you wake up in the morning and say, this would be a good day for someone just to give me a big lie? Okay, how many of you have ever lied to yourself? More hands than I was expecting, actually. Self-deception is probably the worst type of deception. I read in a Christian magazine about someone who discovered this with their son. Sometimes Satan makes a lie, a little white lie, seem like an easy way to get out of a problem. And this woman wrote, My five-year-old son had been looking forward to visiting the planetarium. This is a place where you can look at the stars and look at the planets. This is while they were on vacation. But when we arrived, we learned that children under the age of six were not admitted. Let's pretend you had a birthday, I told my son. If the ticket man asks how old you are, I want you to say, I am six years old. He made him practice it until he sounded convincing, then bought the tickets without any problems. When the show ended, he moved on. we moved on to the museum. There, a large sign read, children five and under admitted free. To avoid a $5 admission fee, I had to convince my son to forget his pretend birthday. The consequences of my lie became apparent as we walked up the steps to our last destination, the aquarium. Wait a minute, mom, my son said with a worried look. How old am I now? So the, son, so the mother understood how self-deception can be destructive. How when people lie to themselves, you just lose sight of who you are. And then she wrote on, Then I knew that I had fallen for Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. There are some people who lie like it's their native tongue. Do you know what I'm talking about? Some people who are professional deceivers. And it's really bad when they lie to themselves about who they are. Self-deception is destructive. Um, you know, in movies or television shows about police. Sometimes they'll have a police who goes undercover. A policeman who pretends to be a criminal, to mix in with criminals, to get information about the criminals, to feed that information back to the authorities. So they have to lie to everyone. They have to pretend to be a criminal when in reality they are a police officer. And in order to maintain their cover, whenever they see a real policeman, to avoid suspicion, to remove suspicion from themselves, they have to get into that police officer's face. They have to really give that police officer a really hard time. They have to show that they hate police so that no one suspects them of being a policeman. And every so often, these undercover police officers, they have to meet with their handlers. They have to meet with the person that they're meant to exchange information with and this handler has to you know many times assess the psychological assess the mind of the police officer who's undercover they have to kind of ask questions to see now the lies that you're telling people have you lied to yourself have you forgotten that you are po a police officer and the longer these undercover police officers are in the criminal organizations the better chance they forget who they are they lose sight of who they are. Their deception to others suddenly becomes self-deception. There are many lies that we believe about ourselves that stop us from moving forward into our destiny. When we believe these lies about who we are not, there's great damage that we can do to ourselves. 
These lies and labels hide the truth of who we are meant to be and destroy the life that we are meant to live. Whether these lies are rooted in shame, whether these lies are rooted in fear or in a misunderstanding of God's nature, they all have the same destructive results. If the enemy can get you to believe a lie or take on a label that you should not take on, then your whole picture of life becomes distorted. There's an identity problem in the United States. I'm sure our visitors could tell us about that. People don't know who they are. The devil wants people questioning their identity. Remember when Satan tempted Eve, that's tempted Jesus, sorry, in the wilderness. He said, if you are the son of God, if you, Jesus knew who he was. He knew who he was before the foundations of the earth. But the devil was trying to get him to question his identity. That same devil is trying to get many of you to question who you are. Because whatever you try to build on a questioned identity will not stand. Whatever life you try to build, whatever career, whatever marriage, whatever you try to build on a questioned identity will not stand. If the enemy can get you to believe a lie about yourself, then he has won. You are not the only one who has fallen prey to self-deception. Here are the 10 most common lies people believe about themselves. So those of you who have notes, please be ready. Number one. I can do it on my own. This is a lie that people believe about themselves. We tend to be entrapped by the thought that our problems are a burden for others. Or we take matters, so we should take matters into our own hands. Too many of us are carrying burdens that are crippling us. Some of us are carrying some hurts that are crippling our minds. Our bodies may be fit and strong, but our minds and our spirits are crippled because of the things that we're holding on to. It is a path that leads to isolation and weariness. A lack of, you know, here in Uganda, I may be touching on some very sensitive subjects here, but let me just go ahead. This is what God shared on my heart to, to speak. We have a lack of transparency in Uganda, a lack of straightforwardness. There are many people who are dealing with problems and they tell no one. They put on a mask. They are very quiet about the struggles, the very real struggles that they're going through. And I understand it's difficult to find people you can trust in our society. I understand that. You have to be careful who you share your intimate problems with. Because with some people, your problems may become fuel for gossip. So yes, you have to be careful. But we have to understand that, yes, yeah, and there are some things that should be kept private. I understand that. But we are to be completely exposed to God. He knows everything and sees everything. All of our burdens should be cast on him. Whether you have one friend or a battalion of friends, we are better together than we are alone. Our problems are not an inconvenience for God. God tells us to cast our cares on him, for his burden is light. This I can do, I can't do, this I can do it on my own mentality is another one of the enemy's schemes to keep us isolated and bound. This thing of, I can do it by myself, I can handle it on my own, that keeps us cut off. Freedom comes when we have done all that we can do to stand, and we allow our brothers and sisters to hold our arms up in our weaknesses. In my personal Bible reading this last week, I was reading about Moses, and how Moses had to have his arms raised for the children of Israel to prevail over the enemy. Moses was an old man at this time, his physical body got tired. And his arms began to fall and he needed the help of two people to hold his arms up so that Israel could prevail. I could imagine, this is not in the Bible, this is in my imagination, I could imagine a critical Jew saying, I thought he was a man of God, I thought he was the leader, I thought he was our pastor, why does he need people to help him? But listen to me, the strong also struggle. The strong also struggle. Moses had Aaron, David had Jonathan, Elijah had Elisha, Timothy had Paul, Jesus had the disciples. I can't imagine how difficult my life would be without the support of certain people in my life and the prayers of certain people. It is a very brave thing to admit you cannot do it on your own. God can always work with that. It's when we're down to nothing that God is up to something. The next lie that we can tell ourselves is, I'm not qualified. There is this notion that only those who are in full-time ministry or on church staff are qualified by God to serve God. Only those who have official titles. 
We exalt position and titles and we discount ourselves. Let me not get started on titles, okay? We have an epidemic problem in Uganda with people and titles. People wanting to be known as a prophet, apostle, holiness, bishop, worship, whatever. But let me ask you, those titles that people love to promote, how do those titles bring me closer to the things that matter most? How do those titles bring me closer to repentance? How do those titles bring me closer to godliness? Jesus made himself of no reputation. I came with some fire from England, okay? I just want to let you know, all right? Jesus made himself of no reputation. There is not a 10-step list of how God chooses or equips his sons and daughters. In addition, God isn't looking for those who pray the most eloquent prayers. He doesn't compare our testimonies next to each other to pick the ones that are the best. He isn't looking at our lives to see who is serving in the most ministries. You are qualified because you are his. His word says in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellence of him. In the Bible, when God called Gideon and Moses to their respect, respective missions, they both had concerns about whether they were qualified to do what God was asking of them. However, they chose to be obedient to God. God is looking for those who, though they cannot see how they fit into the equation, are willing to be obedient. 1 Corinthians Chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you are wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose those that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important if ever you feel unqualified for what God has you to to do I want you to remember this Noah was drunk Abraham was old Jacob was a liar Leah was ugly Joseph was abused Moses was a stuttering criminal Samson was promiscuous Gideon was doubtful Rahab was a prostitute Jeremiah was depressed David had an affair and committed murder. Elijah was mentally unbalanced and suicidal. Isaiah preached naked, not recommended. When God called Jonah, Jonah ran away. Naomi was an old widow. Job went bankrupt. Peter betrayed Jesus. The disciples fell asleep. Martha was a worrier. The Samaritan woman was a multiple divorcee. Zacchaeus was greedy. Paul was ingrained in another religion. Timothy was too young and had ulcers and Lazarus was dead. God does not call the qualified. God qualifies the called. The next lie that we can tell ourselves is vulnerability is weakness. In England, the English culture is do not show emotion. Let me tell you, the English, British people do not show emotions. Even when there's a situation that requires emotion. I don't know if you watched the Queen of England's funeral um, and saw the faces of the immediate family. Uh, showing a tear is against protocol, okay? Showing any type of emotion, showing any type of vulnerability is a sign of weakness. So it's the British culture to keep a stiff upper lip, okay, and not show emotion at all. Keep it inside. That's better, all right? And they think that vulnerability, sometimes some people think vulnerability is a weakness. Of course, you have to be careful who you're vulnerable to. So many of us walk around broken because we allow the hurt or disillusionment from a situation to close our hearts and define who God is. Some of us have closed hearts. And we've been convinced that opening our heart to anyone, especially God, shows weakness. Not to say that there, was, there are some stings in life that do hurt, but there really comes a point when we have to just let go and let God. There comes a point when we have to do that. There comes a point where, we have, where some people have camped in the land of grief and disappointment for too long. We need to trust that God can give us the strength and faith to move on from this difficulty, from this hurt. We need to trust that he can set us free and fill the empty spaces with healing. 
The enemy deceives us into thinking that if we open up and talk about our issues, we will be met with judgment and shame. However, the truth is vulnerability in the right hands will always lead to your freedom. Vulnerability is the doorway to deep intimacy with God. The third lie that we sometimes believe, God could never use someone like me. God could never use someone like me. We say things like that. God has never placed parameters on who he loves, who he commissions, who he co equips, and who he forgives. His response to us has always been come. Come and drink. Come and eat. Come and see. Come and follow. Our one job is to respond to his love manifested through grace. That is it. God will never confront you with your past to propel you to your future. Yes, things of the past will be dealt with along your journey of sanctification, but it's not a precursor to serving him. We need to stop shortchanging our freedom and destinies. There is a sense of unworthiness that we tend to project upon ourselves because of shame. We think God cannot use someone like me. Shame no longer needs to be the lens that we see life through. When we're born again, when we are in grace, we do not need to look with shame anymore. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 reads, Because of joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. You are the joy that has, that, that has always awaited God, receiving you back to himself. Aren't we thankful? Aren't you thankful that we serve a God that disregards the shame and gets you into dignity. He disregards your shame and he brings you to a place of dignity when you are in Christ. He, he created us to be, 2 Timothy 2 verses, verse 21, instruments for his special purpose, to be useful to the master and prepared to do any good work. If God can speak through a donkey, he can use anyone and anything for his glory as long as that person is surrendered to him. Number five. I need to perform to be seen. This is a self-deception that many of you have. Some of you work hard in school, which is a good thing, but you know you have to bring home a good report to your parents to get any type of recognition from your parents. You've got to perform well in school to be loved by your parents, to have any sense of value. It's good that you're working hard, but you might be doing it for the, you are doing it for the wrong reasons, actually, if you're doing it for that. In life, the more you put into something, the more you hope to get out of it. For instance, if you put enough effort into our work, we hope to be noticed and finally get a commendation or a promotion. Such is the practice we have in serving God. Some people fe feel, I have to perform for God, to be loved by God. But then you're not realizing what the Bible says, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to be good, for, good enough. While we were yet sinners, we don't have to perform for God. He loves us as we are. Get out of this self-deception that you have to perform for him to be loved more by him. We have become professional performers, getting involved in every ministry possible. We are in the worship team, the greeting team, the missions team, the youth team, the production team, the offering team, the tear down team, the prayer team, and it's just exhausting. You've heard me said it before, it's possible to make a lot of movement without making any progress. Think about that. We must break the agreement that we are in with this label. We don't have to manipulate God to be seen by God. Please understand that. You don't have to manipulate God to be seen by God. He sees you. He saw you before he knitted you together in your mother's womb. He knew you. We are seen by God simply because we are his. When the prodigal son was far off on his road back home, the scriptures tell us in Luke chapter 15, verse 20, he was still a long way off. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. We serve a God who sees us and meets us where we are before we even lift a finger in performance. Uh, an example I always fall back on is Jesus when he was being baptized. And God spoke from heaven saying, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. God said that before Jesus did a single miracle. Before he fed the 5,000, before he made a lame man walk, before he made a blind man see, before he did any miracles, God was pleased with him. Before you do anything, God is pleased with you. Get out of this self-deception that I have to perform. 
to be seen by God, to be loved by God. The sixth deception is, I am alone. There is this constant theme in the Bible where God goes off the beaten path to encounter those who are alone. Uh, Jesus liked to go to the places he was not expected to go to. I remember in Chogum, I think around 2007, back then Prince Charles came to Uganda and they made all the roads nice where they thought Prince Charles was going to go. Okay, all the roads where they believed that Prince Charles was going to go, they made those roads very, very nice. The first time they've worked on some roads in several decades, okay? But then when Prince Charles was on those roads, he went off the script. He just went down a random path into the village, into the ugly part of Kiseni, I believe. And, the, and the, the, the Ugandans were like a bit afraid now. What is he going to see? What is he going to see? But Jesus was like that. He went off of the expected route to the unexpected route. He found Hagar in the wilderness and provided shade for her head and rest for her weary soul. Jesus found Peter while he was alone fishing and made him a disciple. He talked to the Samaritan woman at the well. He highlighted Ruth in the field. He met Paul in prison. He met Hannah in the temple, Hannah the mother of Samuel. He met with leopards on the road of isolation and demon-possessed people in caves of banishment. God has his eyes on, had his eyes on you since he knit you together in your mother's womb. It is in his nature to always come after the one he loves. He will leave the 99 to go after the one that may be lost. We sing about it here in church. People come and go, but he will never leave you nor forsake you. He goes before you. His goodness and his mercy follow you. His angels encamp around you. His Holy Spirit is in you. God has made it that way that every, man, every move that you make, that every breath that you breathe is met with his presence. You are not alone. He is with you. Get out of this lie that you are alone. Lie number seven. If only I was like this person. There are some people who can compare their life away. They never discover who they are because they are comparing themselves to other people. I've taught about it before. The richest place in the world is the graveyard. The richest place in the world is the graveyard because of all the unrealized dreams that went down with that person. All of the unfulfilled potentials that were buried when that person was buried. They never became who they were meant to be. They were busy copying other people. In a culture of social media, comparisons have become a very big problem. We now see the lives of others through our screens, through stories and posts. We find out about the details of other people's lives. L let me tell you something. Don't believe everything you see on Facebook. I know it looks like they have the perfect life, but that picture was one of the good ones out of the ten bad ones, okay? We don't know what's going on behind the surface. We compare ourselves to the people we see in the movies. Those are people acting for a paycheck. As soon as the cameras stop rolling, you see a different person. However, there is a trap that we are prone to succumb to when we behold something too long, when we look at something for too long, we begin to view our lives through the lens of that thing and begin to see the inconsistencies in our own life. Stop comparing yourselves to people. We glorify the results of someone's hustle, not realizing how much they went through to get to where they are at. We idolize certain celebrities, but we don't know what type of deals they made to get to where they are. Some, especially secular musicians, they have signed their souls to the devil to get the success that they are enjoying. And they have admitted it themselves. They said, I gave my soul to the devil to get to the level that I am at. Remember um, the temptation that Satan gave to, to Jesus, that if you would worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. That was an offer Jesus rejected. It is an offer that many worldly musicians have accepted. The world has been given to them. All they had to sell was their soul. Do you really want to compare yourself to people like that? This comparison is a distraction to rob us of being our true selves. A platform should never determine who you are, but who you are, who you are determines how you use the platform. You are enough in Christ. What you have to offer is enough. You don't have to be fake you can be yourself. Don't let a copy of you, don't die a copy. 
Live as an original whom God created you to be. Number eight, I am not accepted. We all have this desire to be part of something. We all have, I, I had a friend, in, several friends in school. When I when finished school, they went and joined the military, the army, and they went to fight in Iraq. I thank God they came back. But when they talk to me about their experiences in the army, they talk about how the army gave them a sense of purpose. They gave them acceptance. They finally belong because they joined an organization that's designed to do that, to make you belong. But I don't want to belong to a man-made organization. I want to belong to a God-ordained movement. Amen? I find my belonging, I find my worth, I find my acceptance by being a part of God's army first. Any other identification comes after that. We want to be picked first for a sports team. We all desire to be chosen by someone. These all point to an inherent feeling of belonging. We all have a feeling of belonging, saved and unsaved people. We want to belong to something or someone. We want to be accepted. The Bible says that when the world was void, God began to fill it. As he created the sun and the moon and all creation, he declared that it was good. Society tells us that we should behave to prove that we belong, that we need to change our look, our speech, ourselves. And there lies the deception of Satan. Okay, the, listen, the, the, the society today feels we need to upgrade our, our system. We need to upgrade things to, to make everybody feel equal. We need to upgrade our definitions of things and definitions of people. But the Bible doesn't need to be upgraded. Who you are, when you know who you are in Christ, that doesn't need to be upgraded. You can mature, but you still maintain your identity. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 31, it states, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good and he validated it completely. This is before, of course, sin came into the picture and polluted everything. We have been seeking validation in the wrong thing. A validation we already have been given by God. Don't seek to be validated. Don't seek to be confirmed by a man or a man-made organization or a certain movement. Just seek to be right before God. We are first and foremost accepted by the one whose opinion matters most. Our greatest freedom comes in knowing that he has seen the worst in us knows our secret sin and accepts us anyway. The ninth lie that we tell ourselves in self-deception is, what I have to say doesn't matter. Some of you are very silent, you're very quiet, because really personality has been beaten out of you at home, and I don't say this to make a joke, but what happens in many people's homes in Uganda, that's not discipline, that's torture. And some of you have had the personality beaten out of you. You may not have been able to define the issue, but you're very quiet. You're like a volcano that's waiting to erupt. I've been doing this job long enough to know. Very quiet. You keep to yourself. You've convinced yourself that what you have to say doesn't matter. Our strongest weapon is our voice. It is the enemy's tactic to silence us. There is life and death in the power of what we speak. Power to build up and tear down. Power to bind and to loose. Power to bless and to curse. God spoke the earth and the heavens came into existence. When we declare the name of Jesus, we invite heaven onto earth. To stay silent is to squash our dreams. Remain where we are already and never move forward. The devil wants you silent. The devil doesn't want you speaking up. The devil, does, the devil doesn't want you declaring the goodness of God. He hates it when the name of Jesus is spoken. And when that name is coming from your lips. So right now, just very quickly, I want to say the name that is above every other name. I want to say the name that opens heaven's gates. The name that causes demons to tremble. The name that every knee will bow before and every tongue will confess that is Lord. I want to say the name that is above every name in three seconds. One, two, three. I didn't hear everybody. One, two, three. Jesus. You just hurt the devil's ears with that. You severely hurt his hearing capacity. And then finally, number 10. I don't have authority. This is the 10th and final self-deception that we can have. A lie that we can tell ourselves. 
uh, let me say something really quick before I get into this. Authority is not confirmed by the volume of your prayer. There are some people who incorrectly believe that the louder I pray, the more authority I have. Wrong. There are some... <laughs> Okay, I, I could get into this in much greater detail, but it will take me off topic. But please don't think that the volume of your prayer equals your authority. No. No. There are some people who do this, and it, a lot of attention is on them instead of attention being on God, because no one else can hear themselves. All right? Don't think that authority it works hand in hand with volume. No, you can be quiet to hear the still, small, quiet voice of God. The prophets of Baal shouted for half a day to bring fire from heaven. They cut themselves as was their culture. Nothing happened. But Elijah did just one prayer and fire came down from heaven. So please don't think that authority in the things of God is connected to volume in prayer. Jesus only did as his father instructed him to do. That is where his authority lies in his obedience. It has little to do with us and all to do with the one who gives us authority. When we embrace the Father's authority, we become a force to be reckoned with. When we have a proper understanding of who God is and who we are in Him, we have authority. We have authority to do great and mighty things. Not by power, not by might, but by His Spirit. Every time we exercise our authority, we are spreading God's fame and government across the earth. The power of the name of Jesus comes to life every time we use our authority. The enemy is quite threatened by this authority given to us by the Holy Spirit. The devil is not scared of your muscles. The devil is not scared of your, the volume of your voice. He is terrified if you have a correct understanding of God's word and you operate in the authority that has been given to you by the Holy Spirit. So he put, the enemy knows that when we take authority, God's power is revealed. Healing is brought forth, demons flee, souls are set free, lives are healed. We come into our true selves and the kingdom of God becomes more and more at hand. It is the same authority that removed the sting of death from the grave. It's authority and victory that every believer has. As a believer, you have authority. You have authority when you operate in God's will. You need to walk like it, you need to talk like it, you need to act like it. It's time for us to break the agreements we have with these labels and we the, with these lies. We have brought havoc, we've brought destruction in our lives for far too long. It's time to release the kingdom of God and his truth over our lies, or over our lives, to remove the lies. You are accepted, you are chosen, you are seen, you are of worth, you are created with purpose, you are enough in him. You are not a copy. But best, but best when you embrace your tailor-made identity. He knows who you are better than you do. I'll close with this story. A purple dinosaur named Barney is loved by millions of children. I have a picture of him right here. This is something that children are very into, small children. I'm so glad my children have not yet discovered this character. According to a magazine in July 15, 1997, Barney had an accident. During filming of the Barney and Friends show, a cooling fan inside the 60-pound dinosaur sh uh, short-circuited and started to smoke. Okay, so there is a man in this, in this suit, and there's a fan to keep him cool in that suit, and that fan short-circuited. The actor playing Barney quickly got out of the suit with smoke inhalations. The suit was on fire. He was taken to the hospital and soon released. The story of the accident was carried on the news and it upset many people. Scores of parents called the tele television station to say their children were afraid that Barney had been burned or worse, that he was fake. A spokesman for the producers of the program said, I can't, it can be really devastating to a three-year-old. They love Barney and think that something terrible has happened to him or that he's not real. Fantasies like Barney can bring a person good feelings, but a fantasy is a fantasy, and sooner or later the truth comes out. There are all sorts of fantasies, lies out there. Those hostile to God, the God of the Bible, must hold on to those fantasies to a great deal in order to make it 
Okay, the unsaved are holding on to lies that they can live this life without God. They're holding on to a fantasy. They have to hold on to that fantasy. If their fantasy gets set on fire, like Barney got set on fire, then they lose who they are. Sooner or later, those fantasies are seen for what they are. Sooner or later, the truth comes out. Don't lie to yourself. Don't deceive yourself. Don't give in to a demonic made title about who you are. Find out who you are by your maker, by your creator. Reverse the lies in exchange for truth. Thank you for joining us. We pray that you have been blessed. Join us in fellowship every Sunday 10 a.m. and 11.15 a.m. on Musajalumba Road next to Eagle's Nest Secondary School as we celebrate Jesus, our risen King. You can also check us out on Facebook at Elam Evangelistic Church and on YouTube. God bless you.